on we go. So uh, we are in, we're starting the 65th chapter. You know what that means, right? One more to go. Yep. What a ride this has been, huh? Well, I'll tell you what. It's, it's a good chapter. And so is the last one. But here's the opening. What is the doctrine and danger of the me ministry? <laughs> the what? You know, the me ministry. Opera, me, 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 me. All about me. Okay, so we've been all about the Messiah. We've been all about... Um, his glory the through the tribulation through judgment and this is kind of the the final part of of all this prophecy that we've been talking about and we're only going to get we're only going to do half this chapter tonight because there's a lot of cool stuff in there but let's open up in a word of prayer and dive in and father we thank you tonight for your word lord and uh, yet again father we lift up Amy and Dragon Evan on that mountain, Lord, as this rain comes down, Father, that you protect that house, you protect that mountain, and all those folks up there, Father, that you, your hand be upon the entire mountain, Lord. Stabilize those hills, Father. We just ask for protection for them throughout this storm. In Jesus' name, amen? amen. This storm's got to go away at some point, huh? It's been like a month now that, that it's been coming down up there. So, anyway... So, starting here in chapter 65, he says this, I was sought by those who did not ask for me. I was found by those who did not seek me. I said, here I am, here I am, to a nation that was not called by my name. And clearly what, what Isaiah, what God's talking about here is it was the Jews that sought after him, but they didn't ask for him. They were just, they wanted him to bail them out out of every situation that they would find themselves in. And when they got bailed out, they'd be good for a little bit, and then they'd get fall back into idol worship and all the other stuff until all hell broke loose and they were, like, taken captive or something like that. Then again, they would, you know, basically, it was like for, uh, for some of you girls in here that have been to jail a lot. Well, we don't have a lot of girls in here tonight, do we? Well, wow. your mom's going, I've never been to jail. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, Don covered it all, you guys. But if you guys are, for those of you that have never been to jail, just for fun, who has never been to jail in here? Anybody? Seriously? You've never been to jail? Wow. Did you say white privilege? Wow, man. Well, what happened to me then? Dang, right? I think that might be a misnomer there, buddy. But nonetheless, for you and the others, there's a room at the end of your stay at the country club, and uh, they, they do a warrant check, a last warrant check on you. And uh, it's the prayer room. <laughs> Everyone's praying. They don't find any warrants in there, right? It's really quiet. It's very solemn. And then eventually... Usually one or two get, you know, find more warrants, but eventually they'll, they'll let you out and you, you leave that room a full-blown believer in God until you clear the door. And once you clear the door, it's just like this. They sought after him when they needed him, but they weren't really asking for him. They didn't want to have a relationship. But he says he was found by those who did not. He said, I was found by those who did not seek me. I said, here I am, here I am to a nation that was not called by my name. Now, Israel was definitely called by God's name, so what was the nation that wasn't? When we, read the, when we see the word nation, especially in terms of the Old Testament, it means everybody else but the Jews, the nations, which would be us. It would be the Gentiles that, that found him. They were seeking a bailout. We were seeking a savior. So in brokenness, we found God. And here we are. We have a relationship with Jesus. Praise the Lord. But for the Jews, they, it was almost a, a real... Uh, thing of entitlement you know they just got used to God providing all the way back to the exodus the manna and water throughout the desert and and they could just kind of run their own program and do their own thing and they could just like like a big cosmic vending machine when things got bad they could just put some prayers in and things like that and he would bless them with whatever they needed but God don't play that game I mean he'll he'll uh, he'll bless for a while but eventually the hammer is going to come down. And I'm here to tell you right now, the hammer is hovering over America right now. 
it's just ready to come crashing down on a lot of goopy stuff that's going on. In fact, I'll share some of that goopy stuff here. Verse 2 says this, I have stretched out my hand all day long to a rebellious people who walk in a way that is not good according to their own thoughts. Right out the gate there, those own thoughts will get you in trouble. Look at Proverbs 14 real quick. 14.12 goes like this. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Now, I know none of you have probably run your own program with God in here, that you just stay on the narrow road and we never get our own thoughts going, but I'm here to tell you right now that it's those, this is the beginning of rebellion right here. And, and it may even start innocently enough, but um, in that you might think that, you know, I, I can handle my finances, you know, I don't need God's help and all that stuff. And we'll actually see that, you know, that I don't need God thing coming up. But there's other things that have been coming up in our nation right now that I'm going to share with you a little bit because I was thinking, where's Brian at? Yeah. Whenever I, usually when I say that, Brian goes, uh-oh. <coughs> I was thinking, because I saw this, this girl, she's not really a girl, she's like maybe 19 or something like that now. Anyway, um, back when she was 12 years old, some like woke nut convinced her that she could change who she is, who she was born, or she wanted to be a boy, basically. And at, at 12 or 13 years old, convinced her to take... Um, drugs that would uh, change the like testosterone hormones things like that and removed her breasts at 12 13 years old and then in her late teens and early 20s she changed her mind and she wanted to be a girl again but now she has a very deep voice and um, testosterone coursing through her body and and missing parts and she became suicidal and a few other horrible things and really struggling through. And this verse right here, verse 2, these, these people that walk in a way that's not good, I, I've had it up to my neck with this woke crap. Amen? I'm just professing right now these wing nuts that are out there trying to convince our children. Let me, let me go back and, so, and tell you this. When somebody is an adult, when they're 18, 19 years old, if they make a decision in their life, that's entirely up to them. Amen? But the attack on the children of our nation right now, to the, to the youngest age of seven, eight years old, these agendas that are being forced upon them, these decisions of altering their bodies, they can't be taken back. Once the parts are gone, the parts are gone. Okay? And these wing nuts just kind of fade off into whatever... The, rock they crawled out from under and leave these children and their parents and grandparents and everybody else to deal with the wreckage that they've created and I ain't having it anymore I'm just fed up to my neck with it right now again if an adult makes a decision they make the decision but this is my my idea I'm going to put together a group of people and I've talk, already talked to a couple of people about this and we're going to create a little think tank and what that think tank is about is to teach parents and grandparents how to talk to their kids again and not allow social media to be the only thing that is brought into their little minds to make these decisions when they're adults or these crazy twisted in my opinion demonic people that are attacking the children of our nation and we don't know how to say things right. We don't know how to start a conversation with our children. We're afraid to talk to those people because we're going to get in trouble for being woke. Let me tell you what, man. I don't give a flying flea biscuit whether they don't like me or not because God put me on this planet to be the protector and to be the adult in the lives of the children that I have, my children and my grandchildren. And you know what? I no longer choose to allow those people to be the ones that give them only one side of this big story called life. Amen? I was talking to someone at night, and I was saying, you remember when we used to have to talk to our kids about the birds and the bees? How dreaded that conversation was? We had to talk to them about sex. Uh, how benign is that now? I mean, it's like, oh, hey, that's like talking about going and getting a chili dog now compared to all the madness that's going on. But the problem is, 
a lot of parents don't know how to start the conversation without, without getting angry or being judgmental, and then the tension starts, and so rather, they just don't have the conversation at all. And I feel like there's people in our circles that we know or will get to know, and there's resources that can help parents learn to have a conversation with their kids that develops trust and love and acceptance, all that they need so that they can have an actual conversation and give the children the other side of the story so that when it's time to make the decisions they're going to make in life, they're not being based on one side of these people who walk in a way that is not good. Because I'm here to tell you right now, if God made a boy a boy, some whack job doctor taking a pair of scissors and turning them into a girl is not good. It's not okay. They might think it's okay according to their thoughts, whatever their ideals are or something like that. But let me tell you this, what's going to happen in 10 years when they realize, you know, all that stuff I was telling those kids, that was wrong. I just want to publicly say I'm sorry. So what happens to the thousands of kids now that are walking around? We ain't having it. Amen. So there's already a couple of churches I've talked to and a couple of people I talked to. And I think we're just going to get together and, and have a talk and figure out a way that maybe we can come up with a seminar or two or something like that. And we can all sit down and, and help parents with some tools on how to sit down and communicate with their children and their grandchildren in a way that doesn't cause war and division. Amen? Amen. That's my thought. Okay, because this is what I'm thinking, and you guys might agree with me. I would rather have a say in their little minds than just leave it up to that world out there. Because that world out there is doing nothing different than they did when they were sacrificing babies to Moloch. It was all about agendas and their own stuff like that, and they ain't getting our babies, amen? Can we get some love here from the Lord? We're taking back our nation. And, and I'm a patriot, so, you know, I don't mind waving my flag and shoving it, like, in a flagpole to hold it, is what I mean. You guys think I was going to say, you're so violent in here. This is what God says about this. And, and look, remember, we're talking about a story that was written 2,700 years ago. And it's relevant to what's happening today. But have you guys ever stopped to consider the direction things are going right now? What they'll look like in five or ten years if there's not an intervention by us. And what I mean by us are, are us parents that have, that have a desire to see our children grow up and prosper and not have to be subject to whatever kind of bullying that is that brings this stuff on. Um, I, got a, I got a family member right now that apparently chooses to be referred to as they and them. Young, very young, uh, preteen, you know, teenager. And I ain't going to refer to them as they and them, first of all. I'm not going to refer to any of my children or my grandchildren. In fact... I have their names tattooed on my wrist so I don't forget their names. It's, uh, it's helpful when you start getting older. And none of this woke mob is getting these names on my arms. These are the names that God gave me to give to my children. This, this they and them thing, just on a side note, doesn't that imply a problem right out the gate, though? I mean, aside from the pronoun thing, which I totally don't get. I don't understand it. But doesn't that imply multiple personality? they and them in reference to one person well demonic yeah unless that that extra person or that extra thing is a, a demon maybe but certainly it's an it's a clue you guys there's things going on here that i know it's like trendy or whatever people want to call it i say it's demonic i say it's from the pit of hell because what kind of a rational normal adult would go to any child and say, let's take your parts off and shove a bunch of drugs down your throat that are going to change you from what you are to whoever you're going to end up being to a teenager, a child. I feel like in my, in my brain, that, that's crossing boundaries of pedophilia. Definitely child abuse. What the hell are we doing sitting back letting it happen, you guys? There's, there's way more of us in this country than there are of them. 
They want to do their thing, they can do their thing, but hands off our babies, period. You know, the mama bears can be pretty brutal, but papa bears can be pretty brutal, too, when they get up tight. Me, personally, I'm going to sell popcorn. I've seen mothers get, when the moms go crazy on them, and, and all the fighting starts, I make a little money on the side. There's nothing wrong with that. I'll tithe on it, brother. Take it easy. Jeez. This is what happens, though, verse 3. A people who provoke me to anger continually in my face, who sacrifice in gardens and burn incense on altars of brick. What all that is right there is a bunch of man-made junk. All those gardens they're talking about right there are those high places we've read about in Isaiah where they set up all the idols and they dance around all naked and get all crazy and drunk and stuff like that. And that altar of bricks is not an altar of God. It's an altar made by man. And, it, and the purpose of that altar of brick was a white brick, and it was to purge themselves. They were purging to an, a fake God. They weren't confessing and purging unto God. They weren't confessing their sins to Him and repenting. They were, they were running their own program the way they saw best, and then their lives were a mess, and they were hell, and they couldn't figure out what was going on. And when it got bad enough, they crawled back to God and said, Lord, bail us out. And as we get to the end here, you're going to see... Uh, some real serious separation going on. But he goes further to point out what they do. They sit among the graves and spend the night in the tombs. They eat who eat swine's flesh and the broth of abominable things in their vessels. So what he's saying here is they're violating these laws of touching dead things. They're purposefully going against. I mean, this is stuff here that's already like, yuck. Who wants to go hang out with a corpse, man? dig around in graveyards and, you know, squeeze half dried out eyeballs or whatever the heck it is they're doing for fun. They're doing it just to be openly opposed to God's word. And he says they eat, they eat the swine's flesh. Another, another law purposefully opposing God saying, you know what? We're going to eat this pig. We don't care what your word says. We're running our own program. We don't even need you, which you're going to see here in a second. And this last one's pretty gnarly, the broth of abominable things in their vessels. That was the drinking of blood mixed with hard drink or some kind of alcoholic beverage in the midst of their dancing around the fires and calling out to their false gods. None of this stuff was done necessarily, maybe, by, maybe some by a belief. It was all done to in your face to God. He even said it right there. These people provoke me to anger continually to my face. Any of, you, any of you ever have a rebellious child? Yeah? You got a, one or two? Four? Yeah? And they just want to get up in your face and cause problem, man. Remember, remember when our kids first started to learn to talk and the only word they knew was no? No matter what it was, go to your room, no. Eat your dinner, no. Oh, my God. Well, then, then why came in? Why? Why is, is the sky is blue? Why? Because it's blue. I don't know. Why? Oh, God. Okay. That's just a child being a child. This is openly being antagonistically rebellious towards God. Not just rebellious, but going out of the way to be rebellious and to, to push the envelope of the norm or to push the envelope of morality, push the envelopes any envelope, and we're seeing that right now in 2023 America. Groups are pushing every envelope they can, seemingly for no other reason than just to do it. And unfortunately, we've all been trained up just to keep our mouth shut. Don't rock the boat, man. Don't want to cause any problem. Don't want to insult anybody. Well, I'm here to tell you I'm insulted. I don't know about the rest of you, but I'm pretty much sick and tired of all this madness right here. They've kind of had their 15 minutes of fame or whatever well now it's time for us to take our country back again we need america and we need god the number one focus of our nation right now all this craziness they can be crazy it's the land of the free you want to be crazy go be crazy in the desert or something i don't care wherever you want to go but not around our children that's where the line has to get drawn in the sand amen so that's going to be coming up this year too we have a lot of stuff coming up this year amen I'm sure I'll piss a few people off, and I'm really worried about it, like deep in my soul, right? This is what he says in verse 5, who say, check this out, keep to yourself, do not come near me, for I am holier than you. 
These are smoke in my nostrils, a fire that burns all day. Can you imagine? The, and and this, is, this is the way it is right now. I don't, we don't need you, God. We've got this stuff all worked out ourselves. You just keep it to yourself. You stay over there and I'll stay over here until I need you. Then I'll come calling. Until then, don't bother me. You know what? You just get back on your shelf where you belong like a good God and everything will be just fine right there. I'm smarter than you. I'm brighter than you. I've accomplished more than you can ever dream of accomplishing in my life. I just don't need you, God. And you know, God is like, fine. If that's the way it is, then smoke in my nostrils. Can you imagine picturing God with smoke coming out of his nostrils? Being so angry. I mean, remember the cartoons used to do that? Remember when someone would get mad, their head would blow off? Whoop, and this. But it's a fire that burns all day, according to God's word here. And when God uses the terms like day and year and stuff like that, it ain't a 24-hour day. It's an eternity. And these people that have made these choices, not only to reject him and turn away from him and his son, Jesus Christ, but also hurt children and, and willfully attack children. There's a verse in the New Testament that says, it would be better for you to tie a millstone around your neck and drop yourself into the ocean than what you're going to face when I see you, according to God. So, before God gets his hands on them, maybe we ought to have a word. Amen? Pray with them, of course. You guys are, like, violent tonight, man. You, you just see the seething. You know what? You should be seething. All of us should be seething right now. And, and it's a righteous anger as well. It's time for us to take care of our babies, amen? And, and so we shall. But these people are going, everything we're doing ain't none of your business, God. You don't even worry about the stuff that I'm doing. Don't worry about the stuff that I'm pulling over there. Don't worry about those that I'm leading away from you over there. I'm holier than you. I'm above you. I've transcended you, God. Boy, are they going to be in for a big surprise, aren't they? A big, long, hot surprise is what they're going to be in for. He says, Behold, it is written before me, I will not keep silent, but I will repay, even repay into their bosom. I love that part right there, because you remember what you're talking over here? He said they're, they're continually in his face. This is the same thing right there, in your bosom. He's talking about my, my, the repaying, when, when he decides to not be silent, and he acts upon his righteousness, it's going to be right in their face. It, it's not going to be from over there somewhere. It won't be by an email. You won't find it on Snapchat or Instagram or something like that. It'll be them and God Almighty standing alone. Then we'll see how much bigger they think, he, how much holier they feel that they are when they encounter the God of all creation face to face in their bosom. I wouldn't want to be there. The Bible also tells us that it's a, it's a what's the word they use? It's a bigger word, but it's a bad thing to fall into the fierceness and rage of God. It's not a good thing at all. He says, your iniquities and the iniquities of your fathers together, says the Lord, who have burned incense on the mountains and blasphemed me on the hills. Therefore, I will measure their former work into their bosom as well. That generational curse right there. I'm a grandfather. So the, the curse of drug abuse and that lifestyle that I led was going right down the family tree. My boys, my grandsons, even my granddaughters. But God showed up in 1995, and he changed all that, man. Just by giving my life to Christ and turning my life over to him, he broke that generational curse in my family. And that curse is over. The, the things that I did, neither one of my boys have ever even kind of done the things that I did nor my grandchildren as well. This, on the other hand, are those that choose to turn their back or to lead their children into these things, to willfully guide them along or just not participate and, and let the world raise their children. The internet, social media. Have you ever seen some of the stuff that's on social media? Is that really what you want raising your children and your grandchildren? And I, and I promise you that, I, don't, I can't promise you, I don't know for sure, but I would venture to say that most of that stuff that's written on there that, that they are 
developing their thought process. It's probably some dweeb in a basement of his parents' house, probably in mid-40s, hasn't worked a day in his life, still in his tidy whities that he hasn't changed for a couple of weeks. And he's the one sitting there typing all this stuff, giggling to his goofy self as he hits send and wondering to himself in all kinds of glee, I wonder who's going to fall for this chunk. And then someone on the other end of that stuff reads it and takes it seriously as something that they really need to do and consider. We cannot have these people being the last word that goes into our children's brains. Amen? And so on we go. And he says this. They're going to deal with all that stuff too. They're not, you know, just because years have gone by. And, you know, the, the thing about unconfessed sin is it, it'll come back and haunt you. I don't know if you guys know that or not. Unconfessed and unrepentant sin will come back and haunt you. Even, even sin that you've repented of, that you've turned away from, like, okay, I'm not doing that no more. The step of confession is still important. We still need to get before God and confess and get right with Him. We can go on away from the stuff that we were doing and all that, but there's still a reckoning that has to take place. We need to, we need to do it all in one shot when this crazy stuff that you're into right now, whatever it might be, we, when we bring that to God, we confess it to Him. He already knows what we're doing, so you know, it's not that He doesn't. It's, it's a matter of obedience and trust between us and Him. We confess, we repent and turn away, and back on the narrow road. That doesn't mean that, that consequences won't happen, but it does mean that you're back on the narrow road. Amen? And you're why, you, you, you really mean it. The thing about not confessing, just so you know, so we can understand each other here, the thing about repentance without confession is, is generally like a, a get-out-of-jail-free kind of card. If, if your heart isn't broken over what you're doing, the, the separation between you and God, the, the very sin in your life, it is, if it isn't bothering you enough to where you break down before God and go, Lord, I confess this, man. I can't live like this anymore. I've totally gone out into left field. I just I need your forgiveness and your grace and mercy, and boom, you're, you're on the road to repentance. If we don't make that confession up front, the likelihood that you really are going to quit all that stuff is pretty nil. It, if it really hasn't affected your heart and broken your heart because of the, the relationship with you and God, more than likely, it's a bunch of BS. And you know what? God knows that too, by the way. I don't know if you know that or not. Like if you just turn away from something and tell God, well, I'm never going to do that again, you know, he knows you better than you know yourself. And more than likely, you're probably going to find yourself right back in the same boat, but worse off than before. There's another story in the Bible. I can't remember what it is, but it was talked about a, a demon being exercised from a house. And because the house wasn't consecrated and, and given unto God for God's purpose, the demon went out roaming around looking for somewhere to live. And he ended up coming all the way back around to the house that he was cast out of, but with seven other worse than himself, came storming into that house right there. Without that seal of confession, man, without that, that commitment between you and God, the door's still wide open, man, and what might be pretty bad in your life right now can be a whole lot worse, man. We got to get right with God. I mean, you just, at some point, we got to quit playing games and get right with God and get moving. I don't know why, why we take so much time to get there because life is so much better with God in it than it is when we're trying to run our own program. Amen? Anybody running their own program right now? No one ever raised their hand for that one. You know? Like, oh, I am. <laughs> I got it going on. Everybody does to some degree. You know, I wish, I wish we could all be just perfect and we could just commit every bit of our life to God. But, man, sometimes, not because we don't love Him or we don't trust Him, but sometimes we just struggle with that belief, man. Not that we don't believe in Him, it's just that unbelief. You know, I don't know. Man, hand him, you know, putting my kids over to the care of God, that's asking a lot, man. Or my money. <laughs> sometimes that's worse than the kids. Like, you can have the kids. Jeez. And the neighbor's kids, too, while you're at it. But my money, you, I better manage that, Lord. You know, I, I know the bills I have to pay and this and that. And the goofy things we tell ourselves, right? But the second that we do, the second we turn these areas over 
to God in our lives, the blessings come pouring out, man. The peace just comes flooding out of us. Immediately, we feel the presence of God in that area, and we all go, why didn't I do this 20 years ago, man? Uh, welcome to humanity, right? Thus says the Lord, as the new wine is found in the cluster, and one says, do not destroy it, for a blessing is in it, so will I do for my servant's sake, that I may not destroy them all. There will be good within the bad. And there's good within the bad now. I don't think our nation's destroyed. I don't think it's gone. I think there's lots of hope for America, man. I think America has many, many great years ahead, short of rapture, no doubt. But I think also that we're in a battle right now. And I don't think it's just a, a woke versus the non-woke thing. I do believe it's a spiritual battle right now. It has all the earmarks of demonic activity and angelic activity. It has all the earmarks of, of that spiritual battle and principalities and powers of the air that we can't see. So that means that we should just stay out of it, right? No. That means we should put on our armor, cinch it up, and get busy. Get in the stinking fight, man. You're men and women of God. You're a holy priesthood, a royal nation, man. You're warriors of a king. You are, you are servants of the Most High King. In fact, you, you serve in the army of the Lord of hosts. You know who that is? Jesus Christ himself. He commands the armies of heaven. And he goes, hey, you want to be part of this? Come on. You're covered by the blood too. So maybe it's time for us to get off the sidelines a little bit here and lead the charge. They're doing it back east in these colleges where they're doing these revivals. You see how that all turned out? One college turned into like, what, 20 colleges or something like that? What if a bunch of, of men and women of America decided we're not having this crap anymore with you doing this freaky deaky stuff to our kids and everybody just stood up with one voice and said, no more. What do you think is going to happen then? No more. That's what's going to happen. Amen? So God's got a plan. I don't know what it is, man, but you know, when, uh, when he puts these little things in my head there, uh, they usually turn into something. Maybe a trip up a frozen mountain road, but nonetheless, look at Brian over there going, yeah, let's not do that again anytime too soon. We had fun, and you know we did. There's always going to be good amongst the bad. When we look at our country right now and the shape that it's in spiritually and economically and things like that, you can just paint it all with one big brush and say, man, America sucks now. The border's out of control. The drugs are flooding in. It's just a madhouse in Washington. And you know what? God looks at all that and he says, yeah, there's some problems in, in that cluster of grapes, but there's a lot of good in there too, man. And you know what? I want to be part of the good grapes in there. And I want you all to be part of the good grapes there. And then my desire is that it goes right outside that door and spreads right across the country until eventually the cluster of rotten, nasty grapes isn't really that big anymore. And it's surrounded by good, beautiful, plump, juicy grapes, amen, that can be used by God Almighty, and we can have our country back. He says, I will bring forth descendants from Jacob and from Judah, an heir of my mountains, my elect shall inherit it, and my servants shall dwell there. Sharon shall be a fold of flocks, and the valley of Achar a place for herds to lie down. And that's a bunch of cool stuff right there, because... You remember back, we well, probably don't, it's been a long time ago, we talked about Sharon, it's the, the, the name is Sharon, and, and it means beautiful place or flower, and it's, a, it's a, a strip of land between the Mediterranean and the Holy Land, it's very fertile for, for growing like vineyards and herds and things like that, it's, it's like choice land, kind of like our Napa Valley, kind of very similar to that, it's a real flat really fertile ground to grow in and he says this is going to be there for you guys and that valley of Achor is really an interesting one there because that got its name way back in the time of Joshua when he got his butt kicked in I and and God said hey man you got some people here that are messing up man they took some treasure for themselves Achan remember that dude and they took him and they stoned him him and his wife everything man killed his whole everybody there stoned them and then they burned them and that that valley of acre was the was the the name acre means trouble so it was the valley of trouble because they had the problem in the battle because the guy sinned well then after after that was satisfied when the punishment was meted out and it was made right with god it became the valley of hope after that 
And so now he's saying, Sharon will be a, a fold for the flocks and the valley of hope, a place for herds to lie down for my people who have sought me. Those that didn't rebel, that didn't try to run their own program, that weren't walking in their own way and all this other stuff, that didn't say, I don't need you, I'm holier than you, stay away from me. All those people, he has a place reserved for them too. Don't feel like they've been left out of the equation here. He's got a great big gnarly hole all set up for them. And that's where they'll spend their eternity. But those that sought after him, those that truly sought him for his blessing, his mercy, and most importantly, his son Jesus Christ's salvation, all this shall be inherited by them. The battles aren't going to be fun, I promise you that. They're going to be difficult, especially any time that spiritual warfare is entered into by anybody. It's a, it's a difficult battle, but, but don't forget, we are the ones that wear the armor of God, not them. Amen? And we are the ones that are supported by a, a, the, the heavenly host of, of angels that's led by Jesus Christ. Don't fear all this stuff, man. It might seem like you we're going to get our butts kicked. Whatever the, you know what? We're on the winning team. Amen. And then keep the focus on what it is that we're fighting for. We're fighting for our babies. And if, if that's not enough, what's the word I'm looking for? What's the word... Uh, enough uh, reason there's a really good word but you're not helping because you're sick right you can't even hear me can you okay i would say instigation but it's not instigation there's another word for mom no, huh incentive there's the word back there give greg a star okay if that's not enough incentive then i don't know what will ever incentivize you if fighting for it's, it's my word Look it up, Google it, incentivize, okay? <laughs> Is there anything that you can think of that you wouldn't fight more viciously than your babies? Nothing. Nothing in the world, man. But, praise the Lord, it's coming. Mark my words, it is coming. Look what he says in verse 11 here. But you are those who forsake the Lord. Back to this group over here. Who forget... Who forget my holy mountain, who prepare a table for Gad, and who furnish a drink offering for many. So Gad was this uh, false god of fortune, and many was a false goddess of um, destiny, like a future. And so they were, they were offering sacrifices to these gods of their future security, their future finances. They were... It was kind of the last straw that they had pushed away from God for everything. They rejected him and every level. Then they antagonized him by purposefully breaking his laws in his face, openly out in public so everyone could see. And then they offered sacrifices to these false gods rather than going to God for their hope of a future and prosperity and, and a life. They went to these fake gods The whole idea behind all this stuff is these people, maybe they're, maybe they're some that are just antagonistic, but by and large, I really think that they believe all this nonsense, that they've convinced their own selves and their own brains that what their ideals and their agendas are truly right and righteous. And this is why they're so passionate about sharing it with younger and younger and younger and younger people. It's a lot harder to convince an adult of things than it is a 12-year-old kid. 12-year-old kids tend to want to please the adults and the authorities in their lives, and the fact that they're abusing that authority turns my stomach and boils my blood. Amen? Because they have this captive audience, the thing is, again, that captive audience is our children. And now they're going to have to deal with us. Amen? and see if they can convince us of all their tomfoolery. <laughs> Not likely, right? Therefore, I will number you for the sword. You, that's, that's the lot they have coming. Death. Because you know this whole thing back in Proverbs, this way that seems right to men that leads to death, right? Or the wages of sin is death. The, the question is this. How much damage will they do before God stops them? 
or before God uses us to intervene and stop this madness that's going on right now. A lot of damage is already done. You know, thousands of kids have already gone through this stuff. And I do mean kids. You know, before high school age kids that are being taught things and um, convinced of things and decisions are made that they can never change back. You know, all the years that, that they would, like, have boyfriends and girlfriends and things like that as, you know, typically you would have as you grow up, that's all going to, it's just not cool, man, and it's got to stop. Do I seem passionate about this tonight? I'm very passionate about this. That, that, that girl, um, she had such a lost look on her face because she didn't know what to do now. Now she's not what she thought she wanted to be. And whoever these people were that convinced her of that are long gone now. And the doctor, he's the one that they're suing right now. They're suing him, by the way, for removing her breast as, at 12, 13 years old. They're suing him. Me, personally, I think they should be indicting him. He should already be in handcuffs right now and under arrest. For child abuse... Uh, child endangerment, any number of things. If I, if I took a knife and chopped off one of his boobies, I would go to jail for that. Right? Even if he said, well, I want to be a one booby kind of guy. You still can't cut off people's parts, all right? Unless you're on that side of the track. And you know what? There's something very dark about that whole thing. Because just rational thought dictates that that is wrong on so many levels. Not just morally or even Christian as, as a Christian. As a human being, for God's sake, man. It's just wrong. And I know of one group of people that when they get riled up, they get stuff done. And that's Christians in America. You know I know that? Because long years ago, a bunch of Christians in America said, hell no, we won't go. Well, actually, they didn't want to pay taxes, but that didn't rhyme with no. And they fought the, the most powerful army on the planet and whooped them. And then here we are in America right now. With God up front, nothing can defeat us. Amen? Yeah. Nothing can defeat us. So he says, therefore, I'll number you the sword and you shall bow down to the slaughter because when I called, you did not answer. When I spoke, you did not hear, but did evil before my eyes and chose that in which I do not delight. He said he stretched his hand out for many, many days, for years, for centuries. He reached out his hand and tried and tried and tried and tried, even brought calamity into their lives so that they were bent down on their knee and they would have to call on them. But as soon as they were better, they went right back to their old shenanigans and started it all up again. And he said, right here, when I called, you just wouldn't answer. And, and I don't mean when he called when they were in trouble. When he finally said, look, come back to me. I love you. I have blessings for you. I have this entire beautiful life for you. And they said, no, we don't want it. We're going to do it our own way, man. We're going to manage our whole life. He's like, yeah, you're doing a great job of that. Your life's in the toilet right now as it's been. He says, when I spoke, you did not hear. That was the correction. When God, remember we were just talking about that Saturday, that, that correction that comes, it's sometimes we don't want to hear God's correction. We only want to hear his blessing. Then we're just acting just like they did. If that's all we want is the blessings and we don't want the correction that keeps us lined up to where we receive the blessings the way God would have us have them, then we're already off the track and the blessings are out the window. It's like this, certain, this vicious cycle that people get into, man. And all you got to do is turn your life back over to God, man. Just stop what you're doing, man. Get with him, confess with him, talk to him about it. Go, Lord, I got to get back on the track, man. I've just been doing this. I've been doing that. I've convinced myself that it's okay. You, you understand because God knows my heart. It's just a little bit of money. It ain't that big of a deal. Surely, you know, this person is the one that you've sent to me in my life. So I don't really see why we got to wait till we get married. Then the blessings are gone. Just like that, man. And we convince ourselves of all this goofiness, man. And God constantly is trying to bring us back and bring us back till we finally crash and burn. And hopefully at that point, we can confess our stuff, repent of it, and get walking right with him, man. It's just 
I know it seems oversimplistic, but you know what? God designed it that way. You know why God designed it simple like that? Because we're simple-minded. We're simple-minded and we're narrow-minded and we're also single-minded. And a lot of times that single-minded takes us back to our get-it question, our opener. What's the doctrine and the danger of the me ministry? When that's all we think about is me, what I want, my desires, the things that I want in my life. Man, what if we just stop for just a second and ask God what he wanted in our life? I, I promise you this. It'll be way better than anything we come up with on our own. It's always better. But welcome to humanity, right? When I spoke, you did not hear, but did evil before my eyes and chose that in which I did not delight. You knew what you were doing was wrong. And that's the thing about sin, you guys. And, and that brings us up to our time frame right now. We know what we're doing wrong, don't we? It's not, oh, she's not here. It's not ambiguous. I don't have to worry about how I say that word tonight. Not even here. We know the difference between right and wrong, right? We know when we're blowing it. We know when we're stepping outside of his will. We know because it feels good to sin. That's why we sin. That's the crazy thing about it. Satan's, Satan's got it worked out where sin is fun. It's addictive. You might do it one time. Like, I'm going to do it one time, man. One little go, woohoo, and that's it. And you know what? That flesh says, eh, eh. I need more of that. And I need more, and I need more, and I need more. And you get into this, this place where you're insatiable. You can't get enough of whatever it is. And that's the nature of sin. And then you'll be willing to give up everything in your life for that stupid thing that you don't even like anymore. It, it becomes detestable to you and exhausting trying to manage it and run through circles and hide and do all this other stuff to the point where you just can't even move forward anymore. That's the point where we break down and pour God and just say, okay, enough of this, man. i got to come back to you, Lord. And you can do it tonight. You can stop whatever it is that's going on in your life. But that's your choice. So here's the get it tonight. Why do you suppose some Christians don't, don't seek dad or ask for him? Boy, I wrote that wrong. Why do you suppose some Christians don't seek God, don't seek dad or ask for him? Okay, well, however I wrote that, yeah, something's wrong there. But the point is, because they don't want him around, man. Do you guys, do you guys want God around when you're doing a bunch of drugs and stuff? getting drunk you in, do you guys invite God to that motel room like just set up a chair for God and go okay Lord you're there we're going to be over there on the bed we got the camera set up over there so turn on the radio we're going to get jiggy we don't invite God to that stuff right I know I'm, look at Brian's like what's jiggy Google jiggy Will Smith Somewhere in the 80s, Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, I don't know. Point being, that's why, that's why some Christians don't seek dad. They don't want him involved in that stuff. Why don't they want God involved in that stuff? Well, because they know it's not okay. It's problematic. It's going to bring trouble into your life. You're going to be in the Valley of Acor. That's where you're going to live, in this beat-up old busted valley right there. So it's better just to not invite him or not, not have anything to do with God, right? I mean, it's better than to have God showing up every time you're doing something funky, right? Let's just avoid God altogether. We don't even need a building anymore. We don't even need a church. We can just go out there and live like hell until we end up spending eternity there. Or we can recognize the fact that we've blown it in some area of our life and come back to God already. Put on our big boy and big girl Christian pants and come before the Lord and just get right, man. It's just that simple. Check this one out. Why does dad respond with such fury to the hypocritical among us? You, is there any hypocrites in here? One back in the back? All right. I can be hypocritical. I can. I can be a lot of things. I try not to. But the fact of the matter is, sometimes I can even be judgmental. Go figure, right? Especially with a yacht in my hand. Point that thing like a weapon, man. But we, we attain to be better, right? We look for these faults and failures, and we talk to God about them. We're like, Lord, search my heart. Find those things that are offensive to you, because if they're offensive to you, they're probably very much offensive to the people around me. 
But again, we get into our own little box and we don't even realize what a jerk we can be sometimes. How much, of a, how much baggage we're dumping on other people in our lives around us because we're just wrapped up in the me thing. Ask God to search your heart. He'll share, with, share this stuff with you. But when it's willful, intentional, like what we're reading in here, it infuriates him because it causes unnecessary harm to innocent people. And God is very protective of his children. And he will go to great extremes to protect them, even from themselves. If you've ever been hammered by God, because you just can't pull your head out of your hat. Hat. He'll get you. He'll get your attention. Amen. Here's the application. I. What causes us to be tempted to judge or act superior toward other Christians? What makes us think we're all that in a bag of zip ties sometimes? You know, when someone comes in, feet up from the feet up, and we've been walking with the Lord for 20 years and stuff like that. What makes anybody in this room think that they're not one bad decision away from that right there? One bad decision. Nobody in this room from here to that back wall has room to judge anybody. We've never been called to do it. In fact, he says, if you want to do it, knock yourself out. But the same measure you use to judge will be judged back upon you. So if you don't want it, don't deal it out. Well, what the heck are we supposed to do then? You love them. You pray with them, man. You help them find their way to the cross. That's what you do, man. And then you let God have them and take them and do whatever he's going to do with them, man. And you say, praise the Lord, go with God, and move on out the door and look for the next one down there. Not very complicated there either, is it? But sometimes we just feel like we are really something special, don't we? And maybe someone will come for advice or something like that, or they come to confess. Maybe someone's got something going on in their life that has got to confess it to someone and, and pray. And, man, you just come down with bold barrels on them. Be careful, man, because unless you're going to be walking on water for the rest of your life, something's going to come along your way, and you're going to get that same treatment somewhere down the road, but maybe worse even. Way better to err on the side of love, brother and sister. Love and compassion and mercy, just like he's shown us. All we got to do is be Christians, Christ-like, right? When Christ looked upon you, were you something special and shiny? Heck no, man, neither was I. But he didn't reject us. In fact, he went to a cross for us. He gave his very life for us because we are a bunch of stinking sinners. And you know what? He's done great things with a lot of you in this room that I know personally. Amazing things. I've known some of you before Christ even. I've known some of you after Christ that are way less violent now, for instance. I didn't point. Did I just point at you, Cheryl? I didn't mean to point at you. That was, oh, it was like a boom thing. It just, like a spring right there. But I'm not pointing any fingers. I've watched God change lives in here, man. Um, miraculous stuff. Amazing things. I've watched people go through some of the, the hardest things that you can go through in life. And I've watched God just snuggle up with them and love them right through it, man. And make them whole again on the other side of it. God's pretty amazing, man. I think I'm going to hang out with him for the rest of my life. What do you guys think? So, anyway, not sure we're all that, why all that was there tonight, but uh, clearly, uh, well, this whole thing is irritating the heck out of me. It really is. And uh, God's word is pretty clear about it, amen? So, we're not going to go out and burn buildings down. We're going to go beat people up or nothing like that, man. We're going to put it to prayer and then ask God to put the right people in the right places. And we're going to come up with a way for parents and grandparents to dialogue with their children in a way that they can trust each other and be able to talk about anything. Amen? That's all that's really about. <clears throat> Let's pray. Father God, we thank you tonight for your word, Lord. And uh, you know, Lord, your your word your word always lands at just the right spot every single time, Lord. And we thank you for your Holy Spirit being here tonight, Lord. And we do lift up these things that we discuss tonight, Lord. They are problems in our nation, Lord, within our communities, Father, and Lord, we ask you for wisdom and knowledge and grace and mercy and compassion, all that we're going to need, Father, as we move forward and we, we just 
find our way through, Lord. We ask that you be the light that leads this way, Father. But Lord, our desire first tonight is that everyone knows your Son as Savior, your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, and as we pray together as a family, we've, we've, Lord, I pray your Holy Spirit has touched hearts tonight here, maybe out there in TV land, Lord, and that somebody in here, maybe a few people, feel that need to know Jesus for the very first time. And maybe there's somebody or a few people they realize they've just kind of stepped off a little bit too far and tonight they need to come back home and they need to dump a lot of junk here and leave it at your throne, leave it at your altar. So tonight, Lord, whatever's going on in the hearts and minds of everyone here, Lord, I ask that you tend to each and every one of us tonight uniquely in your own loving, powerful, merciful way, Lord. We love you tonight in Jesus' name. Let's all pray. Father God, I sin against you, Lord, and I ask you to forgive me of my sin. And Jesus, I invite you into my heart to be the Lord and Savior of my life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and put me on that road that you'll have me travel in Jesus' name. Amen? Yeah. Amen. Amen. So, sorry I got off on a little bit of a rant there, but something uh, we needed to talk about. So, I will see you when? Saturday? Saturday for church? Or when's the sheep shearing? Sunday. Yeah, I'll see him Saturday. For, do you need a shave or something? Okay, all right. Okay, until then, keep your eyes on Jesus. Amen. God bless you. Amen.